Welcome everyone to this History Hit live question and answer session. I'm Matt Lewis. I co-host History Hit's Gone Medieval podcast and occasionally crop up presenting films. This evening, I'm excited to be joined by someone who's famous for going medieval, Dr. Eleanor Yanega. Eleanor is a medieval historian, co-host of the We're Not So Different podcast, and has presented several films for History Hit, which all walk that perfect line between being informative and entertaining. And I think we're also joined by Eleanor's cat as well, who we're <laughs> all hoping is going to make an appearance on screen any time now. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening or this morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, in fact, drop us a comment in the chat to tell us where you're tuning in from. We've already had some people dropping in from Canada, India, the USA, Poland, and someone from Mordor. So I don't know if you're a hobbit on the way in or an orc looking to get out, but we're all here to help. We're looking uh, for all of your best medieval ghost questions this evening as well for about the last 25 minutes of our chat. So if you drop all of those into the chat, we'll get as many of those as we can to Eleanor a bit later on. So Eleanor, can you tell us what people who haven't seen Exploring the Medi Medieval Afterlife can expect from this film? Yeah, so what I wanted to do really was explain how there are these really interesting social differences in the way that medieval people think about death and the afterlife and how we think about it now. Um, and some of this can just be thinking about, for example, burial patterns and stuff like this. But we are also really trying to consider the conception of ghosts as well here. Um, because the way that we tend to think about ghosts now is that they're kind of like tragic spirits that are floating around usually because um, something's gone really wrong. You know, they've been murdered, something like that, and they need to be avenged. And medieval people have a really different way of relating to that because for them, since there's sort of a clear idea of what the afterlife is supposed to be, you're either supposed to be in heaven, purgatory, or hell, you know, purgatory being kind of like hell for now. Um, it, that means that if you've shown up, then there's been some kind of a break in the order of how things are meant to be. Um, so as a result, we see that medieval people's ideas about that's kind of like hinge on the idea that someone's kind of coming back from the dead to let you know that they are usually in hell and they need your help. So medieval ghosts have done something wrong and they want something from you. Whereas our modern ghosts, something terrible has happened to them and they don't necessarily want something from you other than that you know about it. And so we really wanted to explore kind of like the culture around that and what that means uh, in terms of how medieval people, you know, mediate death, which fundamentally tells us a lot about how they think about life, you know. It's a fascinating and it's a really thought provoking watch and we're going to take a, a quick look at a short trailer from the documentary before we dive into some questions that I've got for you from the film. Ghosts. Ghouls. Things that go bump in the night. There's a kind of adrenaline rush that comes along with a good ghost story and there's a reason for this. Ghost stories survived us from across time and around the world. Every culture on Earth has its own ghost stories. But the meanings behind those ghost stories vary drastically from place to place and time to time. Often, societies use ghost stories to reinforce their own values. In other words, to figure out what makes a society tick, it often helps to look at what makes that same society frightened. Join us as we uncover the medieval phantasmic to find out what the restless dead of the Middle Ages tell us about the anxieties of the living. If that's whet your appetite for exploring the medieval afterlife, you can watch it for free right now by signing up for a 14 day free trial with History Hit. As a special offer today for you guys watching, you can also sign up using the code YouTube and get 50% off your first three months as a History Hit subscriber. We've got some more people tuning in from Austria, Zambia, Switzerland, Argentina, Israel, so all over the world, desperate to hear more about medieval ghosts. So I've got some questions for Eleanor from watching the documentary, but please do keep sending yours in the chat and I'll put all of those to Eleanor as well. So Ellen, I guess my first question is, what was your favorite ghost story that you explore in this film? 
Oh, it, I, so I really, really like the story of Snowball the Tailor, not just because uh, his Snowball the Tailor is a great name. Um, but the reason that I like it is th there's a super long version of it. It's even longer in the Byland Abbey ghost stories than what we were able to get across on screen because it would have just been that one story, <laughs> basically the entire show. Um, and it's got all these really interesting bits of what we understand to be ghost tropes now. So there's these ideas of, you know, kind of like invoking God to protect yourself, which I find really interesting. Um, um, or at the same time, um, you know, when he talks to the ghost at the end after he's got the permission for his soul to leave purgatory, essentially, um, he brings all these kind of magical books. He brings all these Bibles and makes a circle and then summons the ghost and it conjures the ghost and brings him in one place. And these are things that we see over and over again in the modern period. So I really like that about it. Um, but I also like how many times the ghost uh, changes shape. I like that, you know, he shows up as a raven, and then he shows up as a dog, and then he shows up, you know, and there's these things about, uh, you know, the ghost kind of having all these different things that he can kind of uh, have a look at. And indeed, in some of the Byland Abbey ghost stories, you have ghosts uh, showing up as stuff like haystacks, or wheels, or just all kinds of like really strange things. And so I'm, I'm quite interested in what medieval people are saying are like ghostly shapes, you know, and like the scary haystack being quite a good one, you know. Yeah, haunted haystacks, inanimate objects being <laughs> haunted is is weird. Did you have a favorite story that didn't quite make the cut that you couldn't squeeze into the film? Um, yeah, so there was a story that um, I wanted to get into, um, which is a story of uh, Guinevere's mother, actually. So it's an Arthurian legend. Um, and in it, it's uh, quite interesting because like, basically the Knights of the Round Table and Guinevere kind of get caught hunting. They're, they're out hunting and a big storm blows in um, and they're trying to get back to the castle for Christmas. And this horrible ghost appears and her skin is black and she's covered in rags. Um, and she has frogs that are suckling on her breasts. And she is showing up as a warning and saying, I didn't live my life right. You know, these terrible frogs that are, are sucking on me are my lovers in real life. Um, and I was cheating on my husband and I only cared about my looks and I always dressed in finery. And so now I'm in hell and I'm being punished for this. Please pray for me. And then there's a big reveal, which is da da da. It's Guinevere's mother. Uh, and she's and she's in purgatory. And um, I find that a really interesting story because it's kind of helping to underline specific gender norms. Um, whereas we tend to just see generalized uh, Christian things being brought up over and over again, you know, please pray for my soul. Oh, I've been excommunicated, things like this. Um, but here we see this story about how women need to walk the straight and narrow, make sure that you're not participating in, you know, the kind of courtly love things that all these stories kind of encourage you to think of as sort of romantic. There's kind of like a warning on top of it, which is like, everybody, now, I know we talk a lot about, you, you know, extramarital love affairs in Arthurian literature, but don't you do it. You know? and so I think it's a it's a quite interesting and funny story from that perspective. Yeah, courtly love is all well and good to write about and sing about and think about, but don't you dare do it. Otherwise, this is what happens. Exactly. And it struck me, as you mentioned before, from watching the film. So go medieval ghosts normally seem to want something from the person that they, they visit, that they haunt. Mm. What kind of things did they demand and what do those things what do those interactions tell us about medieval attitudes to the afterlife to heaven and hell and purgatory yeah so the major thing is they want out of purgatory now <laughs> so um, and most of them it, it tends to be that they are either in purgatory or um, they are perhaps damned at this moment but if something happens they no longer will be damned um, and that's the case of Snowball the Taylor's ghost. Um, he had been excommunicated from the church. And so what he wants is for someone to get him recommunicated so that he will no longer be damned because if you're excommunicated, that's it. There's no hope for you. Uh, and he manages to get that. But we also see things in certain ghost stories. For example, the first ever ghost story that is about what we call a Harlequin haunt which is where there's essentially um, a parade of the dead that come back from hell. Um, and that has some of my favorite tropes in it where we see, for example, um, people who are being tortured in this parade. And what they ask for is for people to go and restore a mill that they had sort of taken from a miller as payment for property. And the idea was, well, they've already made so much um, on this mill at this point that they had, the, the miller itself, the loan had initially been paid off. So now you're just profiting from another person's suffering. And that's why he was in hell. So he says, please, please, can you go tell my wife and children to go return that mill? And I find that quite interesting as well, because it shows us what the boundaries are 
for medieval people about stuff like profit as well, where there is this kind of built-in idea about fairness in financial transactions. And if you take advantage of those, then that's something that can land you in hell as well. And that's not necessarily a religious precept, right? That's just about kind of social constraints and social norms and being nice to people. And so I kind of like that as, as something that, that gets brought up. So Because we, we don't really think of that now. It's sort of like, well, that's going to be your problem if you got into debt and somebody made a lot of money off of it, you know, but for medieval people, that's a real thing that can jeopardize your soul. So, so it's interesting how ghost stories are used to set out what those accepted religious but also societal norms are. These are the ways that you should behave if you want mm. to avoid purgatory and having to come back and get people to correct what you've done wrong in life. So are, are, is it fair to say medieval ghost stories are morality tales? Are they spooky Aesop's fables that we're, we're hearing? <laughs> That's a great way of putting it because yes, essentially, um, there are very few, we do occasionally see uh, examples of non-moral ghost stories, right? So one of the first medieval ghost stories I ever saw was actually in the autobiography of Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, which is just him talking about, oh, I went on uh, to a battle in Italy and I went here and I went there and this is what I did. But then in the middle of it, he's like, and then I was staying in a castle and my friend and I were sleeping in the same room and we saw a cup pick up from across the room and smash into the other wall. And then we prayed uh, and we stayed up the rest of the night praying because we were so scared. And he's like, and anyhow, back to the battles, right? So um, I find that quite interesting because it, it tells us a lot about how source survival works, right? Because we only get certain things that last down to us through time. And one of the big things and groups of people who get to write things down and get to preserve things is the church. So when they tell ghost stories, they're automatically going to be morality tales because that's what the church wants you to know. They want you to think about the religion and things like that. But occasionally, if you have a really powerful person like an emperor tell a ghost story, it could just be like an anecdote from his life. And there's no meaning there. Like, I mean, we could say, obviously, um, he's got the same thing the violent Abbey stories are telling us, which is like, oh, something spooky happens, quick pray. Right. So that does tell us that it's not just in the ghost stories. That is something that really exists. But there's no moral there at all. But unfortunately, we can't really know that much about what, you know, peasants are doing day to day because they're largely illiterate and we don't get to hear their stories. So we need a monk or somebody to write it down. And monks are going to like religious it up just to stitch, you know, because that's what they do. And right at the, the very top of that religious order, you talk a bit in the film about transi tombs. So these are mm. the idea that people have these tombs where there's an image of themselves as an effigy of them on top, dressed in all their finery, an Archbishop of Canterbury or something in all of his robes with all of his worldly trappings. And underneath there'll be a, a half rotted skeletal version of him, which is what he'll look like in the in the, the future when he's dead. You know, he'll be just like everybody else. And I was wondering, how do you think people like those archbishops and those wealthy people who live these incredibly rich and privileged lives, but try to use their tombs to make out that they're just like everyone else? How do they how do they justify that? How do they are they just deflecting attention from the fact that they live rich lives by saying, really, I'm just like you? Or is there more going on than that? I mean, to an extent, that is part of it. You know, it, it, we have to understand things like tombs as, in general, a form of propaganda, right? You don't make a big grand tomb in a cathedral for no reason. You want people to see it. You want people to connect it with you. And, you know, in the case of the transit tomb that we look at in this, you know, it's in Canterbury Cathedral while he's still alive. So it does this great job of running ground for him, you know, so you're like, don't don't think about the nice house I live in. Don't think about uh, how fine my clothes are. Don't think about anything like that. Think about the fact that I, you know, I know that I'm going to die and that's fine. Right. So that that's certainly a big part of it is that it's a really effective way of communicating these things to people. Um, having said that, you know, throughout the Middle Ages, the riches of the church is a constant problem the like from a theological standpoint so every hundred years or so basically there will be another movement that wants to reform this that wants to bring it back over and over again and you know that's how we invent orders like the dominicans or the franciscans who are supposed to leave poor lives and then they get rich you know and so it's, it's an ongoing problem so as a result we it's also an ongoing way of you know showing the church that they have to do stuff like this and you know usually they'll say okay well i give to the poor Oh, look at this statue. Oh, I'm doing these kind of morality plays and tales, and that's what we want to do. But it's difficult to say because I don't 
it, it, we don't really know how people feel a, a lot of the time and because of how source survival works you know we don't really know how this guy feels in his heart and maybe he does think it's hypocritical you know and that's why he's kind of you know moving in this way to kind of get out in front of criticism um but i i do think that you know, most people who are in the church really are believers and they really do kind of think about these things. And they're just kind of like mm, doing the math that it takes, you know, in order to, to not think about that too much. But, you know, it, it is certainly something that comes up over and over again in the medieval period. So we know it's on their mind, right? And one of the other things that you explore in the film is the idea of deviant burial. So can you tell us a little bit about A, what a deviant burial is, and then B, what should we make of them? Yeah, so I mean, basically, there is a right way to be buried in the medieval period, which is in consecrated ground, preferably in, you know, your own parish, or, you know, if you're very fancy, like a bishop, uh, then, you know, uh, perhaps you have a really nice tomb inside of a church. Um, and basically, the more wealthy someone is, the more likely it is that they are going to be buried inside churches instead of outside. Um, and in general, you are going to have your feet facing east and your head will be facing west because um, at last judgment, you will then rise up out of your tomb to see Jesus and the sunrise and then, you know, the last judgment will commence. And so this is like the established way that things are done. So if there's an established way that things are done, then that means that there is a, when we find burials that don't adhere to this, something's gone on, right? And that's what's called a deviant burial or an atypical burial. And sometimes deviant burials can just be things like, uh, for example, plague pits. But having said that, you know, plague pits aren't just like, oh, oh a bunch of bodies get thrown in willy nilly. They still kind of take care to cross people's arms. They ideally try to keep the east-west configuration. They line people up. You know, they, they, they do the best that they can in horrible circumstances, you know. Um, but we will find people, for example, who are buried submerged in bogs. Um, and that's a real clear sign that people may think that that this person was a member of the Revenant dead who was possibly going to bother the village or they're worried that he will become one. So they're like, throw him in a bog. And if there's something about a bog, bogs come up over and over again. So bogs, watery places, that stops the Revenant dead. And we'll also see people who have been decapitated and sometimes they are buried with their skull between their legs. Um, and so that's like, that's quite a, a big sign there because you go, oh, whoa, right? Like a lot of the time, if it's something like uh, an execution ground or something where somebody has just been decapitated because they were killed, um, we will kind of like find their head somewhere or maybe we won't. You know, um, one of the one of the skulls that uh, we we talk about in the film itself uh, was actually moved by a badger at a point in time. So, you know, that's one thing. But if you've got your head between your knees, we know that somebody did that. Right. And so we think that the, that in those cases, that's someone who is concerned, uh, you know, the, the people are concerned that this is the revenant dead now. So, you know, the right way in a church all the blessings, everything like that. And then the wrong way is, is kind of like, these things are done deliberately to your body so that everybody knows, you know, even now, like they, they, that's what they want us to understand is that when you find his body 700 years later, we did not like that guy, right? <laughs> and so that's, and it, it, it can be really clear even to us, you know. It's like a permanent, I don't know, down vote on social media or something, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, exactly, right. Um, and we, we're getting some really nice questions in the chat, so I'm going to move on to those in a second. But before we do, one of the other things that you explore in the film is the attitude of Victorians and Edwardians who become fascinated with medieval ghost stories. So what does that tell us about attitudes to the afterlife centuries later? Why are they looking back to the medieval period? Well, first of all, Victorians and Edwardians are really obsessed with the medieval period. Um, there's some reasons for that. A, a big part of it is kind of like the process of industrialization. Uh, it makes them sort of, you know, the same way that you'll get people who are like really trad now kind of pretending that they like, I don't know, knights or something like that. You get the same thing with Victorians and Edwardians where they're like, oh, I long for a simpler time when we were all out plowing the fields and we didn't work in cotton mills or something like this. Um, so as a result, you kind of have this sort of long ago and far away understanding of how things are, a real ability to romanticize things. So that's kind of like clue number one, right, where they 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 just like it and they think it's cool. Um, but I also think that there's kind of something in here where they're kind of doing the same thing that we're doing uh, or that medieval people do, where it's like, well, if something is established as being old, then that means that it's like real, right? So, you know, if, if you hear a story about a medieval ghost or somebody from the medieval past, you're like, oh, well, that's some person who's who's really, really dead. There's a kind of authenticity 
that that the older veneer lends to things and i think that's cute and i really like it because medieval people have that about like the ancient world like that's what they like about romans so but we do the same thing with medieval people now and i think that's neat uh but you know it's a, a number of things you know the victorians really know how to have a fascination I'll give them that. And, uh, you know, they, they also just kind of want to show to everyone that there's a lineage to their ghosts because they love a lineage. Love that, you know? Everything has to hark back further and further into history. Mm -hmm. uh, right, we have got some wonderful questions coming through. So Jack asks, if you could be haunted by any medieval ghost, which one would it be and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what medieval ghost do I want to be... Uh, haunted by i think i want to be haunted by um i kind of want the parade i want the harlequin haunt i want like this is a bad the, the, a bad answer because i'm all like i want the mixed bag grab bag i want to see all the ironic tortures because that's what I, I really like um when medieval people do hell scenes and things like that or or the Harle harlequin haunt because everybody who's being tortured in hell is getting like a super ironic torture and, uh, and and i think that that's quite interesting so i want like the whole shebang and to be able to see you know what everybody's done wrong and think about that yeah i want i want like uh the big answer that's cheating i realize uh but um i don't care also <laughs> if you're going to be haunted you might as well be haunted by a part yeah go big you know um is there any difference between how people in western and eastern europe perceived ghosts so this is that's an interesting question um and i think that there does tend to be when we have a look at sort of eastern european ghost things um sometimes if we get particularly far east or i'm talking about you know russia and things like this and um, we do ha tend to see a little bit more of an emphasis more particularly on the revenant dead and a little bit less so on ghosts themselves um, in the kind of straddling borderlands, uh, you know, so like uh, as a bohemian specialist, you know, shout out to Czech people, as, as always. Um, you sometimes see some really interesting ghosts, like one of my favorite ghosts um, is actually a saint. Um, and as he, uh, it's uh, St. Procopius, or as Father Brokop, uh, wait, no, sorry, St. Albert, I, I, too many Czech saints, St. Albert. Um, he, uh, it, actually, one of his miracles is that um, he started a monastery in the Slavonic Rite where everyone kind of like spoke old Slavic. And then after he dies, it's given to a bunch of German monks. So one of his miracles is his ghost shows up and chases all the Germans out. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a miracle, right? They're like, oh, those Germans. Uh, and, and, I, and I love this for us, and I love my people, uh, that, you know, we, we found some time to be nationalistic against uh, Germans in a ghost story. And everyone's like, that's very holy, right? So you do see these, these quite interesting things where it's like this ghost is carrying out a nationalistic beef for religious reasons, and everyone agrees that that's good. And, th and everyone's like, well, I guess he's a saint because he chased those Germans away. <laughs> so That's what God wants. Mm, obviously. Um, Caitlin asks, did they ever hold a version of what we might call a seance in medieval times? So, no, like a quick answer, no. Uh, but that isn't to say that they didn't attempt to sort of like talk to ghosts. And th this is what you tend to see in things like the Byland Abbey ghost stories. If you have a ghost that shows up and that ghost asks you to do something, thing then you try to do it now the other thing that exists in the medieval period and we have a lot of information about is what you call necromancy and this is part of why we don't see a lot of seances um, because necromancy is a form of magic where you attempt to talk to the dead um, and there we, we have lots and lots of manuscript evidence of that people at least were writing down how one would go about doing that but it's absolutely condemned by the church it's considered to be black magic you shouldn't be doing it you need to leave dead people alone stop it right that's kind of their their take on it so we know that people attempt to speak to dead people but it's like by drawing magic circles uh by per putting uh, like candles in particular places, you have to do it at certain times of night. Um, and we do also see ghost stories wherein people are kind of doing necromancy. Um, interestingly, people tend to be doing necromancy to like get answers from dead people about things that are happening in real life. So there's a violent Abigo story about this um, as well, where it's, you know, somebody stole something and people will ask dead people, did you see who stole that? So it's quite interesting because apparently like all dead people are hanging out spying on us essentially and and we'll narc on you uh, and the church is like leave him alone don't do that so you know there is such a thing as talking to the dead or attempting to talk to the dead but it's not like oh let's all uh, try to talk to our dead sister or our dead brother or our dead father which is what seances tend to be the way that medieval people think about it again bit of a grab bag you get in there you see which dead person knows who stole the candles and then that's who you talk to 
but you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. I love the idea that ghosts are just there watching us all, waiting for us to commit, commit a crime. Right? <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. It's frightening. Um, so Cariad asks, were there any friendly spirits in the Middle Ages? Something analogous to Casper the Friendly Ghost. We have a Sir Casper the Friendly mm. Ghost. So that's that's an interesting one because it tends to be there that for medieval people, ghosts usually don't mean you harm. Ghosts want your help. So they are kind of friendly, even if they're scary. So you might be frightened of them, but they don't really they're, they're not meaning to frighten you. They're not meaning to kind of mess with you in that way. Um, although we do see people then, for example, get ill when they make contact with ghosts. So it's just, you know, it's still a very frightening experience for them, no matter what the ghost means by it. Um, and there is one of these kind of distinctions between like the revenant dead and ghosts, again, because the revenant dead mean you physical harm. You know, like the revenant dead will show up and snatch your eye out, for example, which is, you know, no one's idea of a good time. Uh, but, you know, with ghosts, they're not necessarily going to hurt you even if you're frightened. So they are all kind of vaguely friendly, but they're not kind of like stopping by to be like, hey, I love your work, want to hang out and grab a drink sometime. Like that. that's not quite why they would end up there because they can't, right? It's like they, they either need to be in heaven or in hell. And I mean, I guess that there's like the ghost saints are kind of friendly. Like occasionally you have like ghosts show up and the ghost saints show up and do a nice thing. Like, you know, uh, St. Adalbert notwithstanding, shout out. Like, so for example, you know, like I think St. Thomas Beckett's ghost shows up and does nice things occasionally, things of this nature. But for that to happen, you need to be a saint. So it's not just like any ghost, it's it's a saint's ghost. But they do sometimes come with threats, don't they? Sort of, I need your help to do this, but if you don't do it, something horrendous will happen yeah to yeah yeah absolutely it's kind of like it, it, choose your own adventure there uh and you know e oftentimes it's a sort of physical ill health that's a big one um or it's I, i'll send demons after you that's kind of like one of them um or you know things will happen to your crops you know you know like all, all your classic medieval curses right there but yeah they they, they will like you know they're, they're not always nice guys but it, it, it's just kind of like not they're not meaning all of the time to be scary, is the point. Uh, John asks, did the church have an official position on ghosts or did it come more from a local level? Um, so, yeah, the church's position on ghosts is it is an, uh, an official position that they exist and that they're probably trying to get your your help from for being in purgatory and the church are like yeah that that benefits the church you see uh because uh, one of the, the big ways that you get people out of purgatory is uh you have masses said for them and you know what you need in order for people to say masses for you is money so um you know drumming up the idea that like you know people in purgatory and they might come and see you and they need help and you need to have these masses said or you need to get their excommunication reversed this is all good for them this is great for business right so the church are like yeah absolutely you know that's and uh, you know one of the ghost stories that we kind of talk about as well is that um sometimes the church will circulate ghost stories about how oh well this guy who didn't support the pope he's in hell and, and things like that so you know they know when to kind of like hammer at home because it just kind of like reintroduces the idea that bad things will happen we're the intermediaries this is kind of how it works because all of these things involve the church at some point in time so it, it doesn't hurt them at all to to just go with it reinforce their own power mm -hmm. um lucy uh, oh sorry yes yeah, sorry lucy asks is there such a thing as a good death in the middle ages i guess this plays into the deviant burials a little mm. bit was it better to be killed or to die of natural causes um yeah so there is a good death and literally to the point where we have an art trope that is called the good death <laughs> so, so the good death is you realize you're dying um you go home you're surrounded by your loved ones. You make confession. You receive uh, anointing, like an anointment, which uh, is kind of a extreme unction is what it's called. Um, and then you say your prayers. You die surrounded by loved ones. And then your soul is usually taken to heaven. Because if you can do that, ordinarily, you will go to heaven. If you've confessed all your sins, they've been forgiven. Um, and, you know, there's, there's nothing else that can be done. Then off you go um and you'll see a uh, cute little painting sometimes with like angels carrying up little little souls in what looks like a hammock and that sort of thing and i really like that um but uh sometimes though it, it, this is then used to kind of like ram home the fact that that is unlikely 
in a lot of cases. You know, if you fall off your horse while hunting, for example, and die, then you you need to you're, you're in trouble, right? You never got to make that confession. Um, and it's not good to be killed or anything like that as a result, because what that means is that you probably haven't been able to to make confession. Now, you know, getting stabbed and bleeding out slowly, and a priest gets there in time, that's fine. Um, but then they use that as an art trope as well. So um, you'll see, for example, the three living and the three dead. So, you know, three guys show up in varying states of decay and they're like, mm, I used to be like, like you, you know, and that's to remind you that you can't count on the idea that you'll have a good death. You can't just go, oh, well, I'll confess it all on my deathbed and, and I'll be fine because you could just die at any moment from something and then you're in trouble and then you'll end up in purgatory or hell, right? So yeah, the real, real clear idea of what the good death is to the point where that's literally the name of it. It's interesting then that ghost stories can be used to remind you to live a good life, not to just do what you like through your life and store it up for that last minute where you go, oh, I'm sorry about all that. And mm, you're off. Mm. There is actually a consequence to potentially living a, a naughty life. Um, Brable0401 says, what's the creepiest medieval ghost story you can think of? Um, I think that the really creepy ones, um, I'm creeped out by the Revenant Dead ones. Uh, and uh, there, there are some where people say that they realized something was kind of like looking in through their windows, like everybody kind of could feel something was looking in through their windows. And they eventually um, kind of like go and dig up local bad guys coffin and it's full of blood and, you know, things like this. So I, I find like these ones quite gruesome. You know, the, these ideas of like just kind of being watched all the time by not nice thing that can physically hurt you. I find those quite creepy. Um, and there's a lot of them. Right. And they, they're used all the time to kind of like reiterate why people need to be disinterred and, you know, thrown in a bog occasionally and things like this. And sometimes it'll be uh, really kind of scary ones. Uh, like one of the Violent Abbey ghost stories, there's a guy who... Um, he dies. Um, they don't realize he's a bad guy, and so he gets he gets buried at Violent Abbey, and he gets up out of his tomb and goes finds his concubine and like attacks her and blinds her, and like I find that like very you know the idea of your bad boyfriend coming back from the dead and hurting you is quite it's it's quite creepy. So yeah, like they they do get genuinely scary at times. Sometimes when it's like it's a rotating haystack in the air, I'm like I mean I guess guys fine, but you know sometimes they are genuinely quite creepy. I think there's one, is one of the sort, is it Roger of Howden or someone who lists a load of ghost stories as well? And he says there's one where um, a, a woman wakes up in the middle of the night, crushing, being crushed to death underneath the rotting corpse of her dead husband. Yeah. He has to go and dig his grave up and and quiet his soul and everything. I mean, that seems pretty. Uh, and, and like, it, it's those ones. It, it's when there's this kind of like physical link where I'm like, oh, that's a lot. You know, um, if it's just some guy being like, hey, could you help me out and get me re communicated with the church? I'm like, eh, fine. You know, but uh, if you're if you're going to actually like physically hurt me, then I'm scared, right? Yeah. Uh, was there a popular cemetery to get buried in to get to heaven quicker? Um, so technically you're not going to get to heaven quicker, but things will happen. For example, like if anyone ever goes to the Holy Land and they get some dirt from Golgotha and it gets put in a cemetery, that cemetery is about to become extremely popular. Uh, and uh, and we we see the, this happen for again like sorry no I'm not sorry to keep bringing up check things I'm gonna keep bringing up check things uh, but you, you see this uh, for example um, at the ostuary in uh, Kutnora uh, and like by the 17th century when you hit the plague uh, it gets like massively oversubscribed because everybody wants to be in with the Golgotha dirt and then so then they're like I, make a chandelier out of their bones I don't know like how are we gonna get them in here. Um, but sometimes, you know, like being buried in cathedrals and stuff like that is considered sort of like showing your grace and the, the idea that you are like quite good. Um, and also, I think that there there is a lot of the time in Rome, there are particular graveyards that you really want to get into because like uh, some of the other saints are there. So, you know, if you know there's a graveyard where the, the bodies of varying saints are, then you want to be hanging out with the saints. So it's it's kind of like a club thing. So, you know, if you if you can get in with the saints, that's absolutely great. If you can get in with some of the dirt where your boy Jesus Christ died, then that's also good. Will it help you get to heaven quicker? No, but they just still like it, you know. I like the idea of a fashionable graveyard. Mm, fashion yeah. change, you know, whatever's the cool nightclub in town because everybody's going there. <laughs> the graveyard version of that. Um, Evan says, were there any folk tales or stories about people going to hell or heaven and coming back like Orpheus or Eurysides? Uh, yeah, so we we don't really have any stories like that because you can't like you can't you're not allowed to come to come back, right? Like that's the point is that 
you know, Christianity is a very linear religion. You're born, you're alive, you die, and then you're you're hanging out waiting uh, for the apocalypse, essentially. So you can't physically come back in that same way. And instead, what we tend to have is warnings about how it's not going to happen, dude. They're not coming back. And if they do come back, it's bad, right? So it's, it's kind of like exactly the opposite, where, you know, like they're, they're within this com- cosmology. It can't possibly happen, and you don't want it to happen. Right. So like, don't ever ask for somebody to come back from the dead because that's gruesome. And uh, it means that it's, it's never going to be the person that you loved. It's not really their soul. And, and that's the kind of thing that we, we, we tend to see. Um, so there are a lot of warnings about kind of meddling in these kind of things. And like, please don't talk to the dead. Please don't try, you know, and, and so we, we just don't see it in the same way. Um, I think largely because of religious reasons. Yeah. Um, Hilton asks, uh, was death seen as a great leveler or did social status follow you to the final judgment and beyond? Yeah, no, this is this is this is the thing. They're like, it is the great leveler. It does not matter who you are. You are going to die. And this is what we we end up seeing again and again in art tropes. So, for example, the one I mentioned before, the three living and the three dead, it's usually showing like the great. Uh, who are being confronted with the inevitability of their death. So it'll be pe- like people who are princes, or sometimes it's bishops, or sometimes it's, you know, uh, j- just like the richest people that you can possibly think of. And it's like, well, yeah, you might be wearing nice clothing now, but you're going to be in a shroud decomposing at a point in time. And so that's a really big part of it. Um, and then we also see this hammered home in, for example, images of hell over and over again. So if you look at almost any hell scene from the Middle Ages, you will see people who are wearing crowns and you will see people who are wearing bishop's hats or papal tiaras in it. And the entire point, or, you know, monks who have like their heads shaved. And the entire point is it does not matter that you're rich. If you're sinful, once you die, you are just in God's hands and God doesn't care either. So there is a constant uh, kind of refrain to point out that the rich don't get special treatment in death one way or another. And, you know, perhaps that's why the rich end up doing things like leaving large sums of money to the church and, uh, you know, having very nice tombs, things like that. Which works out again very nicely for the church. Exactly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's some kind of plan going on. Um, Are all of the stories referenced so far from a Christian perspective? And do you know much about Vikings, Druids and all of those kind of civilizations thoughts on ghosts? Well, we don't know anything about the Druids. So, no, <laughs> I could go with the Druids. We're like, we know they existed, but we got nothing. We got nothing on them. Um, Vikings' perceptions of ghosts, we know a ton about them. Um, and we know a lot about these uh, from the Icelandic sagas, um, which, unfortunately, I didn't get to talk about the Icelandic sagas. And now the Icelandic sagas go heavy. Uh, into ghost stories. Um, And some of them are from the pre-Christian period, and some of them are Christian, and some of them are a little bit of both. Like, you know, there'll be Christian people, but Loki shows up, you know, like, so it's not a direct process uh, to Christianization. Um, And wow, the Icelandic ghost stories, so their ghosts are corporeal, and their ghost stories, their ghosts are coming to kick your ass. And like, that's what, that's what they are about. Um, And it's really quite interesting, because um, a lot of the time, the ghost stories will be about that you didn't offer, uh, you know, proper hospitality to somebody if they came by um, and you kind of left them out in the cold too long or you didn't feed them well and then their corpse gets up and just like beats beats you or kills you like that there's a lot of that there's a lot of uh, corpses just going around sword fighting people a lot of that absolutely tons of that uh, in in the Icelandic ghost stories um, or uh, teaming up with bears that's one you get uh, which is quite interesting uh, you know the old the old ghost bear team up uh, to fight people but it, it, they do the same thing these Viking ghost stories um, as the Christian ones we say which they they reiterate what the social rules are it's like good hospitality uh not being rude to your guests um being nice to your neighbors uh, things like this so even in you know a society that is still quite uh you know like unchristian they still have like really really similar um ideas about what it is that they want uh so they use ghost stories to do exactly the same thing but their ghosts are way more going to wrestle you <laughs> than the, the the Christian ones are going to, basically. Of course, Viking ghosts are harder than Christian ghosts. Of course, of course they are. Like, they have to be, you know, that's the rules. Um, Matthew asks, do we have any records of skeptics or atheists in the Middle Ages related to the afterlife? Um, we do have records of people being like, shut up, no, you didn't see a ghost. Like, there, is, there is rather a lot of that being like, Mm-mm, no, like, you, you definitely see that. And sometimes you'll see ghost stories where, like, people have to prove something. 
Um, sometimes, though, like when you see those, it'll be like, well, and then people didn't want to give the thing back or people didn't want to X. Or you will see ghost stories where people really want to prove that they've seen a ghost by being like, and he said that there was, you know, gold that he stole buried there. And then you dig it up and it's like, oh, yeah, there is gold buried there. So there are a lot of people who are like, I don't really believe you, even in the ghost stories themselves. Um, atheists, we don't really have records for. Um, and there's a really good reason for that, and it's because you would get in a whole lot of trouble, so you're not going to be like, I'm definitely an atheist, guys. Like, put write that down. Uh, that'll be, you know, because he, why would you... What's this target on my back? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just wouldn't do it. It, it wouldn't be good. Um, and also, you know, it's just simply a kind of a mode of thought that doesn't, like, quite exist yet. It takes us rather a long time uh, to to come up with that one. Uh, the great majority of human history, you know, has has kind of, like, agreed that there might be a deity of some kind or another. So it's a really modern mode of thought, uh, which is really useful, obviously, but we just don't kind of, like, see that uh, in the medieval period. But yeah, like, an idea that, like, the ghosts or the dead are, are going to come back, that is, um, not everybody shares that, yeah. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to end, I'm going to sneak in one more of my questions, because you spend the night at Chillingham Castle yeah. in the programme. Do you believe in ghosts? So I am like, what I always say is that I'm ghost agnostic, right? And I've got the real historian answer here, which is that it doesn't matter whether or not ghosts are real. What matters is that we talk about them all the time. And the way I kind of relate to it is that every single culture on earth has ghost stories. The minute we were able to write anything down, everyone was like, quick, tell a ghost story, you know? And I feel like there, there may be something going on there. And I always kind of relate this to uh, medieval conceptions of magic. Right. So in the medieval period, things that are magic, a lot of times are just things that they don't have explanations for. So, for example, they'd be like magnets. That is magic, you know, or uh, electric eels. Those guys are magic, you know, and, and they, you would see that a lot. And I think that maybe, you know, we, we don't really have everything solved scientifically yet. And there might be a point in time when we're like, oh, it's this thing. You know, and then we'll we'll kind of like understand why the social phenomena relates to that. Um, I don't believe that every ghost is real. I I believe that humans react to something. I get creeped out. I got creeped out at Chillingham. Your girl slept with the light on. Your girl slept with two lights on and the duvet over her head because I was not getting haunted. You're not going to catch me getting haunted. No. So. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Eleanor. That's been absolutely fascinating. It's been great to get under the skin of the documentary as well. Don't forget you can watch Exploring the Medieval Afterlife and hundreds of History Hits fantastic documentaries for free by signing up right now for a 14-day free trial. And there's also that special offer for you today. If you sign up using the code YouTube, you'll get 50% off for your first three months. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Take care and beware of those things that go bump in the night.